we consider this in the light of the Old Testament, in Jewish thought, it's, it's not as good as it seems. For us, perhaps it's, it's light, but for them it was really deep and profound. Now, the trial of the ages, we, we've discussed this for almost a month now. Okay? And we've learned a lot of things about the judge, the judgment, and those who will be vindicated and will be condemned eventually. Now, um, uh, I invite you to focus your your imagination and try to to travel back there at the island of Patmos with John and um, you will be ushered into that vision there in heaven that's found in Revelation all right so if you have your Bibles with you I invite you to open it to Revelation chapter 11 okay and um, I just want to to emphasize something here about God's throne in relation to judgment. Alright, I'll be reading from New International Version. Then God's temple in heaven was open. Okay. John was seeing this vision. And let's try to, to imagine that we're there with John, staring at this vision. And within this temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, bursts of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstone. Hailstorm. And in chapter 16, verse 1, now in KJV, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, what does this mean? That's why I've highlighted here God's temple and temple, as seen in John's vision. Now, my conclusion to this was one. You know, because I'm, I'm leading up the Revelation class, that's every other Friday. If you want to join our small group, please do so. Um, I was blessed to see the whole picture of the book of Revelation before. When I used to study this book, I was always in awe and in fear and in uncertainty. But now, after seeing the whole picture, I can't help myself but to rejoice, but to celebrate and see, see God in picturing him as my comforter, as my stronghold, as my protector, and of course, as, as my savior. Now, these passages actually imply that judgment emanates from God's throne. In other words, God's throne in heaven is the seat of judgment. That's what Revelation is all about. And that's actually uh, in coherence with Daniel 7. You see there the, 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 the scene of judgment as seen by Daniel. And since Revelation is the uh, continuation of Daniel, now we can see, we can appreciate the stream of thoughts here in prophecy. So actually, upon seeing that vision, John could easily relate with that because he was a Jew. But for you, perhaps there with John, being a Japanese, American, Filipino, wherever, perhaps you could hardly relate and uh, appreciate the meaning of the whole vision. But actually, um, I would like to, to, to draw examples from the Old Testament in order for us to, to deeply comprehend, if, if you please, the services, the meaning of services back in the Old Testament. Now we believe in the book of Hebrews, okay, that Jesus was portrayed as our high priest. And if you if you consider the whole book of Hebrews, it's all about better and perfect. Okay? Jesus is the perfect high priest offering a perfect sacrifice in a perfect sanctuary under the perfect covenant. It's all perfect, better than the old one, better than the first covenant there in the Old Testament during the time of the Israelites. And that's actually the, uh, the platform of the author of, of um, Hebrews. Although the author of Hebrews was unknown, whether it was uh, Paul, Silas, or whatever, but you know, most scholars tend to support that it was Paul. Okay. 
So in Hebrews 7, if you have your, your Bibles with you, please turn it to Hebrews 7. Okay. Having still having that that picture of judgment in heaven. Alright. For it was fitting for that that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily. Like I said, better and perfect. For first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all. Very interesting phrase in theology. Once for all. When he offered up himself. Now, of course, the author of Hebrews, his immediate audience was the Christian Jews. So when, when, when that author was actually trying to use the analogy, okay, trying to re relate Christ's heavenly ministry with the Old Testament ceremonies, they could easily relate to them. But for us, of course, I, I will attempt to make this plain and easy for us, even though we're not Jews. That's why um, I believe a couple of months ago, I actually requested <laughs> chaplain. Chaplain Mike, if you could invite the rabbi there on base to explain to us the beauty of the of the ceremonies there in the sanctuary because we're not Jews. As as if I, I would like to explain Shintoism to you. Of course the Japanese could better explain that than me. Uh, anyway, we have the Bibles. We have the Bible and we're not at a loss. However, we have to capture the visual of the services there and to, to know the, the meanings behind it. You know the daily sacrifices is actually all inward services. They bring in their sacrifices, okay, whether that's a lamb, fine flour, dove, um, or a goat or a bull. It depends upon your economic status, whether you, you can afford it or not. And it's gonna be brought there inside the sanctuary. So the services, daily services, actually, the sacrifices were all inward. They sprinkle the blood inside the tabernacle, inside the sanctuary, the great tent. Okay. So you could imagine that the veil there and the furnitures there were all messy because of the blood sprinkled all over the year by the community assembly of Israel. <laughs> so the tabernacle itself, the sanctuary itself, became filthy before the year ends. Okay, of course that's in, in Jewish context. 